Well, thank you first for that, that wonderful introduction. It is wonderful to be able to be here at Blue Earth Summit. It's wonderful to be able to give a talk in my adopted home city. My partner makes wildlife programs here in Bristol. Many of my friends work in the environmental sector, and so I tend to think of nature, the natural world, the environment in Bristol as being natural, natural bedfellows. The Bristol that we're gathered in today, as the census of 2021 tells us, is a city in which 19% of the population are from ethnic minority groups. Almost one in five of the people who call themselves Bristolians have heritage in Africa, Asia, the Caribbean, or elsewhere. And Bristol is slightly above the national average for that, but only by five percentage points. And yet, this gathering, and gatherings like it, simply don't reflect the ethnic makeup of the cities in which they take place. This is not a space in which one out of every five people are from ethnic minority communities. The same is true of almost every event I ever attend, as a delegate or a speaker, in the sectors in which I work, television, publishing, newspapers, and higher education. I'm almost never in rooms that look like the cities outside, and neither are you. Now, ethnic diversity is, of course, visible. Black and brown people are sometimes called visible minorities. Less visible, but just as important, is socioeconomic diversity. And here, again, we do tend to find that it is the liberal progressive sectors, liberal progressive professions, that have some of the worst failures of inclusion, socioeconomic and ethnic. And there are multiple complicated historical, cultural, economic, and geographic reasons for this. And I'm not here to point fingers or apportion blame. I'm as much part of those industries that are failing to be inclusive as anyone else. But what repeated studies have shown is that not only are people from minority communities less likely to work in sectors linked to nature, the natural world, and the countryside, they are less likely in, their, in themselves to feel connectedness to the natural world. Many are far less likely to have access to the natural world. According to research by the Campaign to Protect Rural England, a mere 1% of the visitors who make up the, the visitors to Britain's national parks come from ethnic minority backgrounds. That, remember, they make up 14% of the population and nationally in 20, 2023. And even that percentage is misleading because diversity is higher among younger cohorts of the population, exactly the people to whom it is most urgent, most important to bring into our national parks, to bring into the orbit of the industries, institutions that seek to increase access as levels of engagement with the natural world. The campaign to protect rural England has also concluded that people from those same backgrounds have, on average, 11 times less access in their daily lives to any sort of green space. The UK's minority communities are overwhelmingly urban. Half of all black people in the UK, for example, live in one city, London. And unsurprisingly, they therefore spend less time in natural spaces. Another study, this time undertaking, undertaken by Natural England back in 2017, found that while 44.2% of white people had an opportunity to visit and enjoy time in natural spaces in the UK countryside, only 26.2% of black people were able to do likewise. And the findings of these studies and others show discrepancies in attitudes and behaviors between the white population and minority communi communities when it comes to access and engagement with the natural world. And those discrepancies have to be understood within the context of a broader, more international, but just as worrying setting. Because even before we account for variable levels of engagement between communities, Britain as a whole, the United Kingdom as a whole, is a nation in which the population as a whole feel lower levels of connectedness to nature compared to many other developed na nations. An academic study of last year, published in the journal Ambio, entitled country-level factors in falling relationships with nature, nature connectedness as a key metric for a sustainable future. I'm good to see that it's not just historians who can't resist ridiculously long paper titles. 
that study concluded that despite our sometimes exaggerated celebration of the British countryside, or more often the English countryside is what's being celebrated, despite the huge efforts made by heritage organizations, by wildlife organizations, our environmental sectors, to open doors and improve access, despite our love of the romantic poets of British landscape art, despite countryfile, despite, despite even Chris Packham, the activism of Fergal Sharkey, and even despite David Attenborough, we in Britain sit at the very bottom of a list of 14 European nations when studied for levels of what the researchers call nature connectedness. And this is not how we tend to see ourselves. Our national mythology is that we are a people with a unique connection to the countryside and nature, whether it be the supposedly rolling hills of the home counties or the rugged mountains of Scotland. In part, this is explained by the fact that only less than 1% of us currently work on the land or have any connection professionally to the land. For example, in Poland, 8% of the population are still directly involved in agriculture. So we were never going to come top. But the results are sobering. The academics who conducted it have defined nature connectedness as a psychological closeness with an individual's, within an individual's relationship with other species and with the natural world. And this study and others were carried out not just to satisfy academic curiosity, but because other studies have shown repeatedly that high levels of nature connectedness lead to improvements in mental health. Those connected to nature, the studies have shown, are more also far more likely to value it. They are more likely to seek to defend and preserve the natural world. Those with stronger levels of connectedness to nature are also more likely, therefore, to vote for parties that have strong environmental policies. But one of the reasons why Britain lies at the bottom of the table of 14 nations for nature connectedness is because we also lie near the bottom of the table for biodiversity. We in this country have lost more of our wildlife in recent years than any other G7 nation. And levels of biodiversity are, again, as studies demonstrate, critical in allowing people to feel that stronger sense of nature connectedness and to enjoy the benefits associated with it. Our loss of habitats and species, the disappearance from our lives of once familiar wildlife, means there is simply, simply less nature for us to reconnect with even if we choose to do so, even if we belong to communities in which the habit of doing so is well established. So the statistics I gave a moment ago about lower levels of access to nature among minority communities come on top of that general lack of connectedness to the natural world among the background population. A decreed economic accounting sheet, and let's be honest, self-interested level, the fact that so many people feel disconnected to nature and that they do so in some of the fastest growing communities in the UK is a significant challenge to the business models of many purpose-led ventures and many institutions and organizations dedicated to preserving and promoting the natural world. One demographic projection suggests that by 2050, 30% of the population of England and Wales will be minority ethnic or mixed. If you want to get a glimpse of the future, it's very easy. Go to an infant school in this city, in Birmingham, in Liverpool, in Manchester, in London. Already there, 30% of the children starting school are minority or mixed. If a significant percentage of that 30% in future years feel as they do today, disconnected to nature and are less likely to spend time in the countryside. If in 2050 we are still in a world where the people who go to our national parks, only 1% of them come from those minority groups, then the business models, the economic resilience, the reach of thousands of organizations and institutions and companies begins to look a lot more fragile. We need to address why communities, minorities, feel less connected and in some ways feel, report feeling less welcome in natural spaces. It is of importance to 
everyone who cares about nature and everyone also who cares about equality. The background challenge of how do we make more of the population as a whole feel a deeper connection to nature will not be solved if one third of the population in just three decades time continue to feel disconnected, disinterested and unwelcome in everything that the countryside and the natural world has to offer. Now, I know that in an hour's time here at Blue Earth Summit, there is a panel discussing decolonizing the outdoors. So I will be brief about the next points. But I'm afraid if you give an historian a microphone, a lectern, and an audience, there's going to be a history lesson. And history's got a lot to teach us about why the natural world is an aspect of life from which so many people choose to opt out. And here, class, geography, and history, and race all intersect. As I said a, few, a little while ago, 1% of us, less than 1%, are employed in agriculture. And that is the culmination of a process that began in the 17th and 18th centuries. 170 years ago, in 1851, the year of the Great Exhibition, when the United Kingdom celebrated its astonishing industrial power and its unprecedented imperial reach, the nation also silently crossed a line, a critical line, a line that no society in history up until that point had ever crossed. In 1851, as we know from the census, the United Kingdom became the world's first majority urban society, the first society in all of human history in which more people lived in towns and cities than in the countryside. Victorian Britain rapidly established itself as that country in which the house and the terrace, the workshop and the factory were more familiar than the field and the farm. And yet even in the middle of the 19th century, even as the United Kingdom crossed that line, there were parts of the country in which the vast majority of people still lived in the countryside. And even many of those who lived in cities, worked in industry, still returned to the land at harvest time. Industrial workers from the east end of London returned to Kent each summer to harvest hops well into the middle decades of the 20th century. This was regarded as the equivalent of a holiday for poor working class families. It was not until 2005 that the world as a whole passed the same line in the sand that the UK had passed in the 1850s. And we became a majority urban planet, the planet of the slums, as the brilliant late scholar and activist Mike Davies turned it. Today, the United Nations Department for Economic and Social Affairs reports that 55% of the global population live in urban areas. By 2050, that is projected to have reached 68%. And that is going to be 68% of a population of 9.7 billion. There will be an additional 2.5 billion people living in cities and towns, which most of that growth coming in India, China, and Nigeria. So Britain led the way on a path that the rest of the world has followed and continues to follow. Britain's urbanization in the 19th century was a process that, that began in the late 18th century when millions were drawn into cities by the lure of industrial work, but also by push factors. The enclosure of land into large estates, motivated by, among other things, advances in agricultural technology and agricultural understanding, led to a great cultural rupture Enclosed and privatized, the British countryside increasingly became the realm of giant farms, private estates, and the stately homes at the center of them. Ours today is a countryside of stone walls and gatehouses.